Welcome everybody uh, to the Strong 2020 public lecture series. Here we are at the 12th um, lecture in the framework of the Strong 2020 project. I am Luca De Paulis, postdoc at National Laboratories of Frascati in Italy, and I am the manager of the Strong 2020 website and member of the Dissemination and Communication Board of Strong 2020 project. The Strong 2020 project is focused on the strong interaction at the frontier of knowledge, fundamental research and application. It has received funding from European Union's Horizon 2020 research and innovation programs, and the consortium includes 46 participant institutions, embracing 14 European member states, one international European interest organization, the CERN of Geneva, and one European candidate country, together with host institutions of other 21 countries without European funds benefits, the project involves research in 36 countries and it is structured in 32 working packages, which among them have uh, transnational access activities, virtual access activities, networking activities and joint research activities. The Strong 2020 collaboration offers access to six world-class experimental facilities, COSI, MAMI, LNF, ELSA, GSI FAIR and CERN. And additionally, the European Centre for Theoretical Physics, ECT-STAR, in Trento is playing a crucial role in the project. All the information about the members, the uh, physics uh, which we are investigating, uh, the um, as experiments and uh, any uh, divulgation activities can be found on the website www.strong2020.eu. Let's go now to the public lecture of, of today, The Heart of Matter, The Secret Inner Life of Protons. More than 99.9% .9 of visible matter in our universe is made of protons and neutrons, which form the atomic core of the known elements. So uh, these particles are really, really important. And today with the professor and Dr. Juan Rojo, we will uh, discover more about the inner life of the protons. Juan Rojo uh, graduated PhD in 2006 at the Universitat de Barcelona, and he was then postdoctoral researcher at LPTHE in Paris, at the University of Milano and the INFN, and at the Theory Department of CERN as a Marie Curie Fellow. Between 2014 and 2016, he held a junior faculty position at the, universe, at the depart, uh, physics department of the University of Oxford. And now he is full professor of theoretical physics at the Tree University uh, of Amsterdam and staff member of the theory group of Nick Heff. His research interests uh, uh, quantum uh, chromodynamics, large hadron collider phenomenology, parton distributions uh, functions, jet uh, reconstruction, and substructure and opportunities for beyond the standard model searches from precision observables. More information about uh, his, his, his career, about uh, his uh, scientific experiments, and about uh, any uh, uh, divulgation activities can be found in joanroho.com. So let's go now uh, to uh, the lecture of today, the heart of matter, the secret of the inner life of protons, and I give the floor to Professor and Dr. Juan Rojo for uh, the lecture. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, can you see my slides or should I share them again? Yes, I see. Okay, yes, and I can, yeah. Perfect. So it's a it, it's a pleasure to to be here to give this uh, this presentation. So let, let me start by telling you a little bit about what we are doing today as particle physics in the in the context of the the data the the LHC. So what is a standard model? The standard model is our language that we have to understand particle physics. It's a hugely successful model. 
and it provides a powerful framework describing elementary particles and their interactions. So we know that our universe is composed by matter particles, in particular quarks, that they are the components of the protons and the neutrons, leptons, such as the electron, and the helium silics, the muons, and the tauons, and also neutrinos, that they only interact uh, weakly. In addition, we have the force carriers, such as the photon, that transmits electromagnetism, the gluon, that transmits the strong nuclear force, and the weak bosons, that transmit the weak nuclear force. And 10 years ago, we also discovered the last missing piece of the puzzle, the Higgs boson, which is both a matter particle and a force carrier. So in this respect, it is doubly interesting. By looking at this picture, I could say, well, this is everything. So we've discovered everything that we had to learn about uh, elementary particles, but nothing is farther from truth. We have various reasons, both uh, conceptually, but also theoretically, to know that the standard model of particle physics, though hugely successful, it's incomplete. And it's incomplete because it leaves many foundational questions unanswered, and also it doesn't explain all the data that we have been able to gather in the last decades. In particular, it doesn't explain what is dark matter, which fills uh, three-fourths of our universe. It doesn't explain the origin of the particle masses, for example, why an electron is much lighter than, than a top quark. It doesn't explain what is the, all the missing antimatter in the universe, and also it doesn't provide a quantum description of quantum gravity and other phenomena such as inflation. So clearly, answering all these questions requires the, uh, uh, some new particles and interactions that go way beyond the standard model. So to try to explain how do we investigate this, uh, the, the world of the extremely small, let me guide you through some journeys into the Zepto space. And since we are going to be investigating very small uh, things, I'm going to work in length units of 10 to the minus 10 meters, which is the radius of the hydrogen atom, and energy mass units of 1 GeV, which is the, the mass of the hydrogen atom. So I'm going to be working in units of the size and the mass of the hydrogen atom, which appear to be very, dif very different from our everyday uh, experience. And indeed, nature that is very different from what we are used to. So a bacteria is tiny from our point of view. But in the units of, of subatomic particles, it's gigantic. So bacteria is 10 to the four times the size of a hydrogen atom. A virus, again, it's a tiny, uh, it's, a, it's a tiny object for us, but for the point of view of particles, it's gigantic. It's a thousand times more than the size of a hydrogen atom. And if we go going uh, to smaller distances, we can disting distinguish individual atoms, which as, as I said, this is the, an image of a, a, a scanning transmission microscope each of these bumps here indicates an individual atom. Now, for each of these objects, we require a different, uh, a, a different equipment. So traditionally, science, the, the development has been made possible because we've been able to, uh, to construct equipment that, which allows us to investigate smaller and smaller distances. So with bacteria, we could see them with the first, uh, this, the first microscopes, the optical microscopes. If you would like to image a carefully virus, you should use a scanning electron microscope. And to uh, image individual atoms, one has to use what is called a transmission electron microscope. So each of these uh, equipments uh, provides more and more resolution going to smaller distances. But what about what, what goes further? We are just scratching the surface of the septo space. So if one look inside an atom, what we'll see is that the atomic, atomic nucleus only occupies a very small part of an atom. So the radius of an atomic nucleus, which contains the protons and the neutrons, is 10 to the 5 times smaller than the atoms itself. So an atom, you can think as a, some kind of solar system where all the mass of the protons and the neutrons is in, is in, the, co in the core and the electrons orbiting around at very large distances. If we keep looking deeper, we see that the protons and the neutrons themselves, they are not elementary particles but they are composed by particles known as quarks and gluons, which are the main topic of this uh, lecture. And if we keep trying to investigate what comes, what appears at smaller distances, we'll find, for example, the famous Higgs boson that was discovered at CERN uh, 10 years ago, and even more extreme phenomena that we can investigate. So the goal of particle physics is to try to make sense of the laws of, na laws of nature at the smallest possible distances 
which also means the highest possible energies. So in quantum, in quantum theory, a very small distance corresponds to a very high energy. So a very powerful microscope requires a prof that has a very, very high energy. So the atomic nucleus was discovered by Rutherford's experiment more than 100 years ago. To discover the quark and the gluon solid structure of protons, we had to build a, the slack accelerator of more than two kilometers long. And currently, the frontier machines that we have to learn about particle physics is the Large Hadron Collider, CERN in Geneva. And I will say something about this in, in a second, which is a ginormous experiment of almost 30 kilometers of, uh, of, of length, where protons are accelerated to almost the speed of light and then collide. So this is the Large Hadron Collider. It sits at CERN. CERN is the European Laboratory for Particle Physics. So here you can see downtown Geneva. This is the Jedo. You have here the Alps in your background, and you have this uh, large circumference of 27 kilometers, which is fully instrumented. So we have, there are superconducting magnets all along these 27 kilometers, where protons are injected there, and they're accelerated up to almost reaching the speed of light. Then these very fast protons are made collide at some interaction points, which are for CMS is here, Atlas, Alice, and LHCB. And these very large experiments, you can see here a human as a, as a reference point, they are able to investigate how these collisions take place. I'm going to show you now an animation of the collision at the Large Hadron Collider. And in the presentation, there might be some delay, so please bear with me. The idea is very simple. What do we do at the LHC? You take a proton, you strip it from the hydrogen atom, and then you put it into some kind of tunnel. And in this tunnel, you put a lot of, of magnets. And these magnets, what they do is they accelerate the proton. So it starts going slow, but then the proton is starting to move very, very fast. Once the proton is moving to almost the speed of light, you will have one beam of protons coming from the left, another from the right, and you make it collide. collide. Why? Because in these collisions, we can prove very sensitively what's happening with the laws of nature at the smallest possible distances. So the goal of experiments such as the LHC at CERN is by reconstructing the outcome of this very energetic collision, try to understand, for example, whether there might be some particles that we are not aware of, or whether the interactions with, that are known to us are everything, or instead there are new forces of nature that we've never been able to investigate. So the Large Hadron Collider is one of the examples of the machines that we use nowadays to investigate uh, particle physics. There are other machines in the worldwide uh, community, but also there are plans to build new experiments. One of these, which is particularly useful in this context, is called the electron ion collider, which is a polarized electron nucleus collider which would fingerprint the mysteries of the strong nuclear force. So it will be built in Brookhaven, in Long Island, close to uh, downtown New York. And in this, in this experiment, instead of colliding protons and protons with the Large Hadron Collider, we instead collide electrons and protons. Why? Because protons are composite, they are messy, while electrons, they are fundamental, they are very clear proof of the substructure of matter. So as you can see in this animation, we'll start to, to accelerate separately the electrons and the protons, and afterwards we make them collide. And actually here we can collide not only electrons with protons, but also electrons with nuclei. This is this reaction here, you have an electron which interacts with some heavy nuclei, and by studying this reaction, we can understand, for example, how the substructure of the protons behave when you have a proton within some part of a heavy nuclear. And this experiment will allow us to answer fundamental questions, such as, for example, where does the proton spin come from? So the proton spin, the proton has spin one half. We've learned whenever we have our first quantum mechanics course, but we don't really know. We we'll understand the breakup of this one half among its constituents. Does it come from gluon spin, from quark spin, or from some other behavior? So the proton is certainly an extremely interesting object, and it's something that is worth devoting this, this public lecture. So one could claim that the proton is a very boring particle, right? Surely, you know, we've been learning about the proton since the rutherford heger martin experiment more than 100 years ago. So in this experiment, they accelerated alpha particles. Well, this is from the result of some radioactive decays. And then they scattered them of a very thin foil of gold. There were two competing models of the nuclear of the atom at that time. One was the, the so-called the plum cake model. You had some kind of 
of, of cake and the electrons were like the raisins in the cake so scattered through the uh, through the through the cake and another model which the nucleus had all the electric charge positive electric charge in it and the electrons were scattered were orbiting around so the results of this experiment showed that alpha particles most of them passed straight some of them turned back and some of them were scattered which was co consistent with the so-called solar uh, system model of the of the atom where you have all the nucleus in a very small area in the center and then surrounded by a cloud of, of electrons. So this was the discovery of the atomic nucleus and uh, by transitivity also the discovery of the proton as element of the nucleus. So I could say that after 100 years, we know everything about the proton. But this is nothing, nothing farther from reality. So actually, in the last years, we've been unveiling new phenomena within the standard model. So as I mentioned before, one of the goals of particle physics is to try to understand whether there are new, new forces or new particles beyond the standard model of particle physics. But actually, even within the SM itself, there is a still a lot of phenomena which we don't understand. And our goal is also to gain a deeper understanding of what is the physics that governs the standard model. For example, we've learned that the, the, the gluons in the proton contribute to the proton spin. We've learned that there is a significant component of antimatter in the proton, and we've quantified it carefully. We know also that in some regimes, the proton behaves as compared, composed only by gluons. And in a study that we presented last year, and it's the main topic of this talk, we show that the protons can contain components which are heavier than themselves, which are called intrinsic charm quarks. So clearly, for a boring particle, this is, this is quite remarkable. Why, why, why is this so? Why is uh, that nowadays we are learning new things about the proton that we couldn't have discovered 20, 30, 50 years ago? And the reason is that the proton is a microcosm by itself. So a proton is a bound state. It means that you cannot, you cannot separate its constituents. And it's composed by quarks and gluons. So you can think of some kind of, of box. And then you open this box, and you will see quarks, which are the matter particles. And you see the gluons, which are these little springs here that they, they keep the proton together. So you have two types of quarks, balanced quarks up and down that they give the proton its quantum numbers. For example, why a proton has electric charge plus one? Well, because it's composed by two up quarks and one down quark. And the up quark has charge plus two thirds and the down quark minus one third. So the charges of the two up quarks and one down quark add up to the proton charge. But this is like a very naive picture. Once one digs deeper, one also discovers what is called the C quarks. For example, the antimatter counterparts of the up quark, but also a strange quark, charm quark, and even more exotic quarks. And these arise from quantum fluctuations. So in quantum theory, everything that can happen does actually happen at some point. So for example, you can have a gluon, which is split into a quark antiquark pair, and then modifies the proton wave function. So these gluons here, these little springs, are essentially the glue that keeps the matter together. So if these gluons were not present, the proton will just disintegrate into its a, the quark component. And it's extremely difficult to break up a proton. So it's only once you go to very energetic collisions that the proton can disintegrate into it, its constituents. This is why we need to build machines such as the Large Hadron Collider, because if we collide protons at low energies, we don't see anything interesting. It's just like two billiard balls that scatter, but we don't learn much. But if the protons are very energetic, close to the speed of light, then you can actually resolve all this fascinating substructure here. So up to now, we've discovered six different types of quarks. You have the up and the down quark, which are much lighter than the protons. So a proton is around, let's say, a one giga electron ball. And the up and down quarks are a thousand, a thousand times um, uh, lighter. Why the mass of the proton is much higher than the mass of the up and down quarks? That's because most of the proton energy does not come from the mass of the up and the down quarks, but actually by the binding energy of these gluons. In some sense, the gluons are what dominate the proton mass as compared to the mass of the up and the down quarks. And then in the standard model, we have a duplication, actually a triplication. So this is the first family of quarks, up, down. There is a second family, which is called uh, composed by the strange quark and the charm quark, and a third family on the bottom and the top quark. One of the main and solve mysteries in particle physics is why nature is triplicated. So why there is a, why there are three copies of the first generation? We don't know. 
And why the masses are so different, we have no idea. For example, the top quark is also is almost a million times heavier than the, the down quark. And we don't have we have no clue about what, what is the case. So for a long time, we've known that the proton contains up and down quarks, but also strange. So a strange quark is around 10 times lighter than the proton itself. And general quantum mechanic considerations tells us that this should be actually a, a component. The topic of this talk is about the charm quark. So the charm quark is around 30% heavier than the proton itself. So if you, if you, if you think classically, this cannot be in the proton. So you cannot have a package that weights one kilo, open it, and find something inside that weights two kilos. However, quantum mechanics is subtler. And as we'll see, we are discovering that the proton is yet more interesting than what we have been thinking so far. But we'll come back to this in a second. So why, why the proton is, is so, why are we learning new things uh, with, from the proton as we have better experimental techniques? Because a proton is an object that depends a lot on the resolution with which we examine. So in quantum mechanics, we cannot say what are things by themselves. We can say what is the outcome of an experiment. And if we measure things in a slightly different way, we'll find a different aspect of quantum reality. So the proton is exactly the same thing. What is a proton? Well, it depends on what are you measuring. If you look at a proton from, a, from, a, from low energy, so a proton from afar, it's just a, a point particle, just a billiard volt, no substructure, not particularly interesting. It has a mass and a charge. And other than that, we don't, uh, we don't learn much about the proton. However, once we increase our energies, and this typically means energies higher than the, the proton mass itself, we find that there is this substructure, which I mentioned. So a proton is not just a point. You look closer, and then you see it's some kind of container that contains two up quarks and one down quark. But now you, you dig deeper. So for example, you use better microscopes, which in our language means you use more powerful accelerators. And then you see that it starts to become even more interesting. So you have various parts of quarks, anti-quarks, and you have the gluons, which uh, bind it together. So from afar, just a point, start to get closer. You see the three valence quarks. You look even closer. So you see all the C quarks and gluons. And if you keep increasing the energy, you find even more exotic phenomena. You find heavy quarks. You find photons, leptons. If you look at the proton at high enough, at high enough resolution, you might even have find a Higgs boson inside the proton. So indeed, the proton is a microcosm by itself. So in this talk, I would like to keep it uh, uh, available to a wide audience. So I've basically removed all the mathematical equations. However, I will just be showing a couple of them. One of this is a question that explains mathematically how do we describe proton structure. So this is an object called a parton distribution, which tells us if you have a proton at the LHC, for example, moving very fast, how likely is to find inside the proton, for example, an up quark that carries 50% of the proton energy. Well, this quantity gives me this probability. For example, in this case, this is the probability of finding a gluon which carries a fraction x of its momentum. For example, if x here is 0 0.5, this means that this gluon is carrying half of the proton energy. Of course, the sum over all the energy of the constituent will equal the energy that the proton has from energy conservation. Furthermore, these objects depend only on an, a scale called Q. Q is the energy of the hard scattering reaction. So it's the inverse of the resolution length. So as I mentioned here, the proton looks very different if you probe it with low energies or at high energies. And this quantified by this uh, energy Q. So the more energetic your collision is, let's say the, the more interesting phenomena that you will see inside the proton. These objects are very important for particle physics. For example, every single prediction that you do for events at the Large Hadron Collider, for example, if you ask yourselves, OK, how many Higgs bosons will the LHC produce next year? Or how many dark matter particles could the LHC produce? Well, you have to use these uh, objects in your calculation. The bad news is that these objects are, uh, we cannot compute them from first principles, at least with current technology. So we have to extract them from data. So there is a whole, uh, a whole family of techniques which go under the name of global QCD analysis, 
which essentially they aim to extract these quantities from a wide array of experimental measures. So specifically, one is to cook up some model for the gluon PDF, and then you have to parameterize it and constrain these parameters from the data. The good news is that uh, we have also support from the theory, in particular, the dependence on the, with the rational scale, it can be computed from first principles using Feynman diagrams. And also we know that this, this object should satisfy some conservation rules, for example, energy conservation and quark number conservation. And these are basically accounted for in the parameterization. More, more towards the future, there is encouraging work in what is called lattice QCD calculation, which means that one takes the equations of QCD and put them in some large computer, and once tri one tries to evaluate these quantities uh, numerically. But for the time being, the dominant constraints come from the experimental data, so from the phenomenological analysis. So let's say that now you're happy because now you understand what is a proton made of. Can you make a prediction for something happening at the LHC? For example, the LHC is now running at an increased energy. How many Higgs bosons will the LHC produce? That's an interesting question to ask ourselves, because if the number which I measure deviates from the number which I predict, this could be the sign of some new physics beyond the standard model. So in particle physics, the master formula to make these predictions, so how many Higgs bosons will the LHC be producing, is composed by two different uh, contributions. On the one hand, this is the probability that you will have, for example, two gluons scattering into a Higgs boson. So you have two gluons that they fuse together and then produce a Higgs boson particle. And this quantity you can produce, you can compute from first principles using Feynman diagrams. However, you also need a second component. You need to know how likely it is to find a gluon inside the proton and another gluon inside the proton with the right amount of momentum. Even if this number is very large, if, for example, the gluon content of the proton is, is, is very small, this number of events would be tiny. So clearly, understanding what we expect at the LHC and making robust theory predictions requires to making to having a very detailed understanding or how likely to find a gluon or a quark or some other particle inside the proton. So this is, these objects are essential for LHC phenomenology, but also for many other experiments. I don't have the time for this, but if uh, you also are looking for uh, extragalactic neutrinos at neutrino telescopes such as uh, Ice Cube at the South Pole, you'd also need to understand how many gluons does the proton have in order to make to interpret these predictions. So in every experiment that involves the proton or a nucleus at, at, in a high energy collision, we need some understanding of the proton structure to make theory predictions. So this is how the proton looks like uh, in a snapshot. So remember, x is the momentum fraction carried by the, the proton constituents. So the higher this number here in the y-axis, the more likely which is to find a proton, a, a quark or a glue inside the proton. So this is how the proton looks like at a scale around the proton mass. This is a lower scale in the particle physics jargon. Of course, it's an extremely high scale, but for particle physics, it's a smaller scale. So you have here the up and the down valence quarks. Why they have this shape? Well, because the integral under this curve should be two, and this, this curve is one. Why? Because the proton has two balanced up quarks and one balanced down quark. And here you have the C quarks. This is the gluon divided by 10. And this is the antimatter down quark, antimatter up quark, antimatter C, antimatter channel. And as you go to higher scales, such as the ones that you prove at the LHC, this is the mass of the Higgs boson, what you will see is that there is a steep rise of the gluons and the C quarks. And in particular, also the heavy quarks become sizable comparison with the, with the light quarks. So this is interesting because this tells us that if you collect protons at very high energies, you will maybe not be sensitive to the traditional up valence and down valence content, but mostly about the gluon and the small XC quarks. So again, what a proton is depends on the resolution at which we look at it. If you collect two protons at low energies, you will mostly see this region. If you collide them at high energies, you will be looking at this region here. I have here some nice animation, hopefully I can, I can run, which was made to illustrate what I just said. So this is how the proton looks like at x 10 to the minus 4. You mostly see the C quarks and the gluons. As you increase in x, you have less C quarks and more valence quarks. And as you go to a high x, 
you only see the three valence quarks. So each of these blobs with different colors is one quark. And as you can see, they are bound together by, by the gluons. So this is a simulation that shows how the proton is modified by looking at it at different, uh, different uh, resolution length. So as you can also see here, if you look at the proton at very small x, remember low momentum fractions, you only see as the, the, the gluons at the small x uh, and the C quarks. As you move towards higher values of the momentum fraction, you will see more and more the valence structure. Okay. So if you look at x, for example, of 0.3, you basically see the, the valence structure. Uh, another way of looking at the proton is the following. This is what happens if the proton you increase q square, the resolution. So due to relativistic uh, uh, contraction, the proton, when it moves very fast, the direction of motion, it becomes some kind of, of pancake. So a proton in an LHC collision is not two spheres. Actually, it's a highly complex uh, pancake. This is because of the effect of a uh, special relativity. That is, you move very fast, you're going to be compressing the, the size of the proton in this direction. So this is how the proton looks like in an LHC collision. So it's the frontal view is very different from the, uh, the view across the, across the axis. So frontally, looks the same. But if you look, say, from the side of the collision, you see this flat pancake which is essentially, at this very low x, a collection of only gluons and sequels. So there are many ways in which we can learn about the proton structure, and various groups apply different techniques. The method that I'm involved with is called the NNPDF uh, method. It's something that, that we've been working on for quite a bit of a long time. And the idea is to use artificial intelligence techniques to try to extract information from the data while minimizing the need of any uh, of any theory assumptions. For example, this is the typical neural network architecture which you use to parameterize the structure of the proton. So instead of, of trying to uh, invent some kind of relatively simple model, what we do is we say, well, I don't want to say anything about the shape of the gluon PDF, essentially. I don't want to say anything about these shapes here. I would just uh, introduce a very flexible parameterization in terms of artificial intelligence methods, particularly a uh, feed forward neural network and then train these networks to the data until they find the best possible solution. And this is useful because if we are to learn a new phenomena within the standard model, so within the, the proton structure, we need to minimize theory biases. Of course, if you assume something, you're going to get it from your data. But it's only when you remove all these theory assumptions that you can have really a, a clean interpretation and uh, learn interesting stuff. So if anyone wants to learn more about AI, you can ask me afterwards. Here, I will show how this works in practice. So what we do is we, we first generate a large, a large sample of replicas of our experimental data. And then we train a different machine learning model in each of them. So each of these scores here corresponds to a possible machine learning model at the beginning of the minimization. So in green is for the gluon divided by 5. In orange is the machine learning model for the up valence quark. And then in blue is our prediction for the anti -up, so the antimatter counterpart of the upward. So at the beginning of the say minimization, none of these replicas, none of these neural networks have, have seen the data. So they have all these kind of crazy shapes. But now we start to train the model to the data. And what happens is that slowly as the, as the model uh, improves, each of these individual uh, cores becomes closer to each other. Why? Because each of these green cores, for example, represents a good solution to the optimization problem so this, that describes the data. You still hear some outliers here, which result into a very large uncertainty band. But this, this means that some models are harder to train than others. But at the end of the minimization, we end up in a solution where there are no outliers. And essentially, the spread between the, all these curves here gives us a measure of the uncertainty in your prediction. So as you can see here, now all the models have converged. And we have reasonably similar predictions for the size of the gluon, the up valence quark, and the antimatter up. And this is important because these objects, they have some uncertainty. And our role is to be able to pro provide precise predictions. So we'd like to decrease these errors as much as possible. Because this way, we can simply do better physics. So one of the, our goals as particle physicists working in this area is to be able to essentially compress the size of these error bands to the smallest possible amount. Because this way, we're able to investigate, for example, possible new forces of new particles 
in a much with much better resolution. So that this was about the proton itself, but what about the charm quarks, which is the, the core of this talk? Well, this is a something that has been discussed for a long, long time, the charm content of the protons. So the common assumption is that the proton wave function does not contain charm quarks. Why, why is this so? Well, if you remember what I what I mentioned before, there exist six quarks in nature, the up and the down quark, which whose mass is around a thousand times smaller than the mass of the proton. Second family, the charm and the strange. The strange is about a tenth lighter than the proton itself, but the charm quark is, is heavier, 30%, and then top and the bottom. So if you put in a scale, on the one hand, a proton, and on the other hand, a strange quark, the proton weights much more. The proton is around 1 GeV, strange is around 0 0.1 GeV. So easy. And this means that quantum mechanics predicts that in general, there will be strange quarks in the proton. Why? Because you're going to have gluons, and these gluons can split between S and, 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 the, and the S quarks. So this process is not uh, is allowed and it's not mass suppressed. So in general, we should expect to find in the proton strange quarks, and indeed we find them, in addition to the up and the down quarks, which we also find them because of the quantum numbers. However, the charm quark is different. If now you put a charm quark in a scale and you put the proton, the, actually the charm quark weights more than the proton. So this would strongly suggest that the proton should not contain any charm quark, right? Because how can it be? It's like you order some package, and then there's the delivery person comes and give it to you. Okay, be careful, this package is heavy, it's 10 kilos. Okay, fine, you open it, and then you find inside, inside something that weighs 100 kilos. That's impossible, right? The contents of the package cannot be heavier than the package itself. So with this, re with this reasoning for say 40 years, most analysis assume that the charm quark was not present in the proton wave function. So the proton contains intrinsic up, down, and strange, but not intrinsic charm quarks. This does not mean that in the proton we cannot find a charm quarks because there is a subtle difference. Let me try to explain it. So as I said, you have protons and you have gluons in the proton. If the proton is energetic enough, some of its constituents, in this case, the gluons, will also be energetic. If the gluon is energetic enough, you can have this reaction whereby, a, say, the, the proton emits a gluon, and this gluon splits into a charm anti-charm pair. So this reaction here is allowed by the theory of the strong nuclear force, so a gluon splitting into a charm anti-charm pair. And this means that in high energy collisions, we will find a charm quarks in the proton, not because they are, say, some intrinsic component, but because they generate via quantum radiation processes whereby this very energetic gluon splits into a charm and anti-charm. And these are called extrinsic charm quarks. And you can also have by the same a phenomenon, if the, if the proton is, is energetic enough, you can even have Higgs bosons. But this doesn't mean that there, is, there are charm quarks in the proton wave function. This means that you generate them via some radiation process, but outside the proton itself. So if the charm quark is, is generated radiatively, this means that the charm content of the proton is trivial. There is nothing to understand in the sense that if we know the gluon, we can compute very precisely what is this contribution, and then you know, then we are done. So if in this, in this scenario, whereby there is no charm quark in the proton, it's only always in the final state, then there is nothing to learn about charm in the proton. However, shortly after the discovery of, of QCD, as the quantum field theory of the strong nuclear force, some researchers predicted that actually it doesn't need to be so, and that there could be an intrinsic charm component in the proton wave function. For example, this is a paper by Brodsky, Hoyer, Peterson, and, and, and Sakai uh, 43 years ago, where they made the very bold claim that the proton wave function, so which describes what is its structure, could, could have the usual component, two up quarks and one down quark, but it could also have another component, which is up, up, down, but also charm and anti-charm. In principle, this is allowed. So there is no law in nature which predicts, which forbids for this term to exist. However, since the, the charm quark mass is so high in comparison with the proton mass, one could think that this component would be very small. Now, let me mention something subtle about quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, we don't have this state or this state. 
in general, the problem wave function is a superposition of up, up, down, plus up, up, down, CC bar. What does it mean? Does the problem contain sharp quarks? Yes or not? Well, it depends. If this coefficient is much bigger than this one, this means that in most reactions, the problem will look only as up, up, down. But if this coefficient is not too small, this means that there will be some probability, small but non-zero, that whenever we collide protons, we find this state in our scattering as opposed to this state. So all these calculations and various models that have been proposed uh, since then, they were all based on similar ideas that there should be a non-zero component of the proton wave function that contains charm quarks. However, this intrinsic charm has proved uh, to be extremely elusive. And there has been four decades of extensive searches and until recently, there has been no unambiguous evidence. So this has been a topic hotly contested in the particle physics community. Now, what has changed since then? So we published a paper last year in which we uh, we, shed, we, we shed some new light about this, this topic. Again, I mentioned that I would only have two, top, two slides which are technical. This is the second slide, and then I will be done for today's lecture. What we do is the following. So when we extract the charm component of the problem from the experimental data, what we exact, what we what we measure is, is is the sum of two components. One is the component from this uh, radiation. So we know that there is some charm quarks that come from gluon emission. The second component is the one from an intrinsic uh, wave function of the proton. So what we extract from the data is the sum of this bit, which is known and we can compute quite precisely. And from this bit, which is unknown, and we don't know exactly uh, how large it is. So what we do is uh, we extract the charm PDF from the experimental data using the, the artificial intelligence techniques, which I mentioned before. And we are especially careful trying to understand what are the errors of our measurement. Okay, The goal is not only to extract the charm PDF, but to extract with the highest possible precision. So now we use our best QCD calculations we put together more than 5,000 independent measurements of hard scattering processes, which constrain the charm PDF. So we extract from the data the charm component of the proton. But this charm component is the sum of a, let's say, known or boring piece, which is the perturbative part, and the more interesting piece, which is the intrinsic component. So if there is no, if there is no charm in the proton, this piece would be zero, and our measurement would coincide with the, pre the prediction of the the radiative charm component. If there is intrinsic charm, there will be some difference. So now what we do is we use the tools that QCD offers to us, and we separate these two pieces. Essentially, what we do is we compute theoretically what is this bit. And then since this we measure and this we compute, then we subtract them. And the reminder is the intrinsic charm component of the product. So uh, again, I'm, I'm cutting a short, a, quite a long and technical story. You can ask me afterwards if you want, want to learn more. The bottom line is that we are able to first extract from the data in a modern independent manner the champ content, and second, to subtract the known component. And in this way, whatever remains, if it's zero, then you know we've learned that there is no charm in the proton. If it's different from zero, we learn that there is charm in the proton. So these are our, our main results, which was published in the, in the Nature Journal in uh, August uh, last year. What we see here is the blue line is our best, uh, best result, our best prediction for the intrinsic charm content of the proton. And then the band is an estimate of the uncertainties. And there are different components. They come from the data, from the methodological assumptions, from the missing higher orders. What happens is that what we see is that clearly there is a region in which the error band is different from zero. And this is what in particle physics we're interested in. would like to find that we have some effect which deviates from zero or deviates from the previously assumed models. So if one does the calculation, one finds that this deviation from zero is around the 2.5 sigma. Sigma is the size of this error band. And typically in particle physics, we call three sigma is evidence and a five sigma is a discovery of something new. So actually, you, one can make this, pre, this prediction more precise by including other measurements. And at the end of the day, we can find a significance of at the three sigma level. Now, this is very nice, but how it, does it compare with some predictions? So these are two models. BHPS is the original model from Brodsky et al. So this, this paper from uh, uh, 43 years ago. And it looks 
remarkably close to our prediction in terms of the shape. And the, the green curve is something called the Mason variant cloud model, which is even closer to our prediction. So we don't claim to be able to tell apart models among them, also because the comparison between the models and the QCD quantity is a bit subtle. However, what we find is that clearly there is something in the problem which is more, say, uh, more subtle than just the radiative charm that you would expect by these mechanisms. So this is part of the story, but it's clearly not, not the whole story. There is something else to explain the charm content of the problem. So this, the fact that our measurement is different from zero within uncertainties is very important. Is very important because if our error bands were all over the place, we cannot claim any any significance. So the fact that our uh, uh, model independent measurement of the charm PDF is different from zero in the large X region, which is the region where precisely models predict intrinsic charm, is something that made us quite confident that this result is genuine and that indeed we are seeing a possible evidence of intrinsic charm in the product. Now, what, how we can understand this? So how we can make sense of, of this, of this intrinsic charm? So assume that you have your usual proton. Proton is composed by an up quark, an up quark, a down quark. And the different colors is that because in, in QCD, uh, there are three different types of charge, three different colors. So this is, this corresponds to an up quark, up quark and down charge with different QCD charges. But if you think, if you look here, you see that the proton can be the usual up, up, down. Plus from time to time, it can have a component of up, up, down CC bar. So in quantum mechanics, how can we visualize this? As follows, you have your proton. And every now and then, this proton will fluctuate into up, up, down, charm, anti-charm, charm much more massive. And afterwards, it will come back to the, to the previous configuration. So let me put it again. You start with your proton. Nothing happens. And for a brief amount of time, this proton fluctuates into a up, up, down, charm, anti-charm, which you can access experimentally. And then it goes back to the previous result. So provided we can accumulate sufficient data on these collisions, we will be sensitive to this very special, say, occasion in which the proton becomes something much more complicated than up, up, down. That it becomes also, it exhibits that there is a possibility of being also a charm and anti-charm. And in this case, note that the mass of the, that the, the size of these balls of the charm, it's bigger than the proton itself, because as I said, the mass of the charm core is big, larger than the mass of the proton, which is impossible in classical physics, but it's allowed in quantum mechanics because this state exists only for a small amount of time. And during this small amount of time, there is no violation of, for example, energy conservation. So this combination of the say, uncertainty in terms of quantum mechanics makes possible that the proton can contain constituents which are heavier than the proton itself. And what made us especially confident of our results is that there was a completely different experiment, so that had never, we had never talked with them, which found a similar result. So as I mentioned, at the LHC, we have proton-proton collisions. And one possible uh, measurement is the one of production of a Z boson, which is the mediator of the, strong, uh, of the weak uh, nuclear force, and a charm core. And if you look at the reaction that leads to this process, you have a charm core, which scatters with a gluon, and then it produces a Z boson and a charm core, which you can measure. Clearly, this measurement will tell us something about the charm content of the proton. And in particular, as measured by the LHCb experiment, which instruments the forward region of the LHC acceptance, it becomes sensitive to the charm content of the proton in the region precisely where these effects are most significant. But I insist that this was done fully independently. There was no crosstalk between the two authors. And what they, our LHCB colleagues, they found is that this is their measurement. In blue is our prediction based on a intrinsic charm. And in green is the prediction based on radiative, radiative charm. So this is just a single point. So you cannot really start jumping up and down. But still, it's quite interesting that our prediction based on intrinsic charm that has never seen this data, it's based on completely different data set. It's a spot on, while the prediction based on the petrolic charm is clearly suppressed by up to a factor of three sigma. So this measurement was, you know, we were very happy when we, we saw it because it was an independent confirmation that, were, that were, our results were going into the, into the right direction. So that's something quite, quite nice in science whenever something is going to, uh, is going to confirm, uh, 
to validate independently your results. This is one of the reasons that made us confident that our claims were soy. So I think I'll, I'm going to stop very briefly and then so we have some time for questions. So I think it's really exciting times for particle physics because we have several frontier facilities which are operating in parallel in the next two decades. So I've mentioned the Large Hadron Collider and the Electron Ion Collider, but there are so many other machines that are relevant for particle physics and that will be operating in the energy and the intensity frontiers, say for, and from now until after, uh, after thousand and, uh, 2040. And these experiments are going to provide a deluge of data. So the LHC, for example, seems that has been with us for a long time, but it, it has only accumulated less than one tenth of the data that will accumulate by the end of its operations. So we are, in some sense, are in the infancy of the LHC era. And these measurements, together with the ones from the EAC and other machines, are going to help us to address open puzzles and anomalies, both within the standard model and beyond it. Of course, one of our goals is to try to break the standard model and to find new interactions beyond it or new particles. But also be within the standard model, there is a lot of uh, fascinating physics that we should and we are going to un uncover. And that they are going, they are telling, uh, telling us incredibly exciting information about the lo loss of nature at the smallest possible distances. So I think that I would recommend people to stay tuned. And let me also end up by thanking my collaborators. So I've presented these results, but of course, science is a, is a team effort. And these results would have been impossible within the support of my amazing team, which I'm showing here. So I think that's everything from my side, and I'd be happy to answer questions if there are from the audience. Thank you, uh, Juan Rojo. Thank you for your uh, very interesting and brilliant uh, talk. Uh, I see that there are uh, for uh, now no questions in the in the in the chat. So, uh, however, I have a, a couple of questions. The first one I want to ask is: uh, uh, Which are the next uh, experimental steps, uh, in your opinion, to uh, get uh, more uh, close uh, into the uh, description and into the creation of models? Uh, to uh, understand better this kind of phenomena? Yeah, I, I, I think that there are, there are at least three options whereby we can learn more about HRM. One is about uh, repeating this kind of measurements at the LHC, but with much in increased statistics. For example, during the high luminosity LHC era, we are going to have measurements of zeta charm production that can essentially add more points here and with smaller uncertainties. So this will, will be clearly be, be helpful. The, we also need in, independent confirmation from other experiments, and in particular, the electron ion collider, which will start operating in seven years from now, will provide very clean measurements of charm production in lepton nucleus scattering. So the measurements of the EAC for sure will, I think in a more or less definitive matter, determine whether or not there is charm in the proton, as we claim in our study. And there's also the interesting connection with astroparticle physics, because the possible presence of intrinsic charm in the proton, it also affects the event rates for experiments such as the ones taking place in the South Pole at the Neutrino Telescope Ice Cube. So if there is, for example, more charm that we previously thought would be in the proton, this can increase the rates of some events that can be measured in these uh, high energy neutrino telescopes. So at the end of the day, this is uh, in some sense an experimental question. As we accumulate more and more data, these predictions will become more and more precise and we'll be able to tell apart not only intrinsic charm versus no intrinsic charm, but also models of intrinsic charm. For example, I have not discussed this, but some of these predictions, of uh, they tell us that there should be more intrinsic charm than intrinsic anti-charm or vice versa, uh, less intrinsic charm than intrinsic anti-charm. So these experiments will also shed some light on the fine details of this comparison between the data and the model predictions. OK, and uh, I see that there are no other questions. So uh, I ask uh, another one, but it's only a curiosity. Uh, there could be the be to, to possibility to hypothesize maybe uh, also uh, something similar for bottom and top quark. Yes, in, in principle, let me go back to this slide here. The mass of the bottom is around three times heavier than the charm itself. 
so it's a bit higher than not a lot. In principle, there is no reason why if there is no intrinsec charm, they should not be intrinsec bottom. Unfortunately, we don't really have data at this point that can provide sensitivity to intrinsec bottom, but in the coming years, this is something that could be studied. For the top quark, that's I think that's more difficult because the top quark is more than 100 times higher than the, the, charm, the, the charm itself. So any if intrinsec charm is already quite small, it's less than 1% of the proton's energy, intrinsec top would be at the level of 0.1 per mil or so, so it would be impossible. So intrinsec bottom is possible and it's interesting, but intrinsec top, it simply, it will never happen. It's, it would be ex extremely suppressed. Okay, uh, thank you for, for the answers. And uh, I see that uh, there are no questions. So I uh, think that uh, uh, it's uh, all. Um, thank you, Huaro, for this brilliant and uh, uh, great thoughts. Uh, the great lecture that uh, uh, will be, however, for those who are interested in to see it uh, uh, again, will be uh, online uh, uh, soon on the on the live events page of the website, so you can find it uh, every time. And uh, I thank uh, also uh, the uh, platform created at LNF, from which we have the the the, the conference uh, and uh, the conference. The, the lecture and uh, uh, wish uh, to see you all uh, at uh, the next uh, lecture in the framework on the strong 2020 uh, project. Bye.